Greetings and welcome to Revna Den. I'm Michael Hassenfang and this is a new segment called Tidbits. As you saw in a previous video, I released one called Side Notes, which is about 15 to 30 minutes long, um, as opposed to my actual episodes, which go for a half hour and even longer. These tidbits are only going to be about maybe, you know, 5 to 15 minutes, just, just a little quarter of an hour segment which I'm going to talk about things which uh, I may have missed in the previous episode or just little nuggets that I've had throughout the week that I just want to throw out there which may not pertain to a certain uh, episode or one that may tie into it. In this particular one, the first episode, I'm going to go into the discussion of the days of Joel, which I forgot to mention both in the days of Elijah and the days of Noah. And I said I would do that, so <laughs> here we go. There's not too much in discussion of the book of Joel within the Bible that I'm going to go into. However, I will emphasize and suggest and highly recommend to you that you read it and see exactly if this is not the days we are entering into or if you think that this is the time when the Lord is going to act upon what he said he was going to do within that book give it a good read and it could be one of where you uh, may associate it with the end of the tribulation the end period of the seven years of the tribulation it could be that as well too but i think this is bringing in a new subject uh in relation to the kingdom age where this war that or supposed war that they're trying to start up that they're trying to ramp up to get tribulation in at a faster pace is going to be ended and cut off by the lord and i think the book of joel speaks upon this and he wants us to get into gear with what he is calling us to do and how to be in constant prayer and constant decreeing and declaring and also fasting and mourning for these countries, uh, especially that of Israel um, and the conflict which they're in. And it seems that from this turning point, he will bring in the kingdom age as it is expressed at the bottom of the book of Joel, you know, within the final chapter. So if you read it, you'll see that there will be this turning point once we get into full alignment and our hearts in the right posture for what God is calling us to do. It's not just a facial value. Like he says, do not rend your clothes, rend your heart. It's it's not lip service. It's not a fake it till you make it. He, he wants us to be in total alignment and agreement with what he is doing at this time and a total turning from this worldly system to what he is trying to put into place. And what's we acknowledge that and are in agreement with him and he sees our cries and sees our prayers and sees that we are trying to call him back this is when we will see this whole raising of the dead the glory come upon us the kingdom age fall upon us and this new system this new way of life kick in the gear which will last from what some prophets say for a century or so until the tribulation happens and i know some people are kind of asking well but how does it go from not seeing these enemies anymore, this Babylonian system get tore down, and then this new kingdom age get established, only to have it fall again at a future date. And I was thinking about that and reading up in Revelation, and how Chuck Missler says that the letter is given out to each church. It was specific for a church, um, but it was also specific to the individual's within Christendom. Each of us read this. It was it was not just one letter given to one church. All church got everyone else's report card. And so it was speaking to the church as a whole, even though these letters were distinctly for specific churches and their failures, if you will, or their compliments that the Lord gave them for what they were doing and what he was going to give them. And it's not like they got those specifically. We who are in the body of Christ, who are the bride, will receive all these gifts, but also need to look at the failures of each church and how to improve upon that. Sorry, I have a better bastard reflux. The third part of these letters is that Chuck Messler said that they were also written in ages. And if you look at the church age, you will see how it started and it progressed through all these until we are reaching this new age of what is the age of Philadelphia. 
And a lot of people think that we are entering into this new age once the Lord comes and flips the table, so to speak, and bring in this new era of what he wanted um, on earth as it is in heaven, so to speak, is this new um, age of Philadelphia. And if you read the letter to Philadelphia, all the churches want to be Philadelphia. All of them. It's like, no, this is, this is our church. We entered into this age. And it's like, dude... None of you have entered that yet. There is not one single church that has entered into the age of Philadelphia. And it seems that once this flips, it's going to turn the world and Christendom into the age of Philadelphia. And I believe the falling away of that from the prosperity that we get from this new way of life, from everything that, that we'll be uh, just claiming and, and reaping in um, from what has been sown, <clears throat> I think there will come a point where those in Christ or that of the world will start falling away again because we become uh, fat cats, so to say. It's like we've, we, we have all the wealth, we have all the prosperity, we had, everything is given to us, we're the, we're the lender, not the borrower. You know, it's like we start getting pride into us again. And I believe this is where Laodicea falls into place. Now, there's, there's a lot of us who think that Laodicea is also speaking of today's day and age. And... I was always sort of, I don't know, juggling this, thinking like, well, is is Laodicea speaking of how we are now and uh, the conflict between the age of Philadelphia, or are they distinct ages, as Chuck Missler said, where it progresses down, we're entering into the age of Philadelphia, and we got like probably a century or so of that, then we're going to be entering into the age of Laodicea, which is at the very end, right before the tribulation. And this is why it kicks it off is because almost as if we are the ones that let it fail yet again, because the Lord has provided us with everything we need. And now we've kind of put ourselves in this, this, uh, I guess, prideful manner of thinking that we don't need God anymore because we have everything we need, even though he was the one that provided it to us. Now we become the age of Laodicea where we're neither hot nor cold. We don't feel for the Lord anymore. It's like, even though we have all the prosperity and that's going to kick off the final rapture. And uh, once the last person is saved per se from that time, the last true Christian, that'll kick off the rapture. We're gone. And in it comes the seven year tribulation. So to hopefully wake up the last remnant of people on earth to what is uh, true and right. And, you know, they wanted a world where Satan was in control, per se, or God wasn't in control. God removed his hands and said, OK, you can have it. Here's the last seven years of complete and utter hell. Those of us who think that we're going through the tribulation, I don't think you really understand what the tribulation is then. So it's the final wake up call for those who aren't saved. All right. And for the Antichrist to come on the earth for those who wanted him and God is just removing himself, removing the Holy Spirit, anything that was godly, which includes the presence of calmness and um, the covering and protection that you have from the Lord. Uh, there was a person that I mentioned previously, Bill Weiss, you know, the 23 minutes in hell where he, he went to hell and had all this vision of everything that went down where they even attacked him and started ripping him apart there and stuff like that. But he believes that the Lord masked the pain and masked the fear uh, where he felt some of it, but not the full extent of it. And once he came back to earth and the Lord left him, he felt the full blown effect of being there and almost lost his mind. It makes me wonder during the time of tribulation, once God removes his hand and lets the Antichrist take over, if that same covering that we have here today that we take for granted that we don't even think God God is doing for us is removed and that fear just comes in at full rapid pace i hope it does wake up some people but um i don't think we'll be here uh during that time i think we'll be watching from above down below the actions taking course during that time to finally bring in those tribulation saints um that being said I don't know if Laodicea is the thing that kicks off the tribulation, the age of Laodicea. And it, it seems to me that we're going through this dark period um, where we're being thrown on the sickbed before we reach into the age of Philadelphia, where the tables are finally going to flip. God's going to get rid of this old world Babylonian system. And we usher in this new age of how he wanted it to be. 
uh, on earth as it is in heaven showing us this is uh, i don't want to say um eden conditions but in a sense bringing us back to that style that way of life where we're supposed to be stewards for the earth taking care of it growing our own crops and eating our own foods that aren't completely uh, hogwashed with uh, all sorts of chemicals and GMO and stuff like that and making us sick and making us fat and destroying us and poisoning the air and poisoning the water and poisoning the food and poisoning everything that that we touch so I think that's going to be part of the flip <clears throat> another thing from the Nephilim which I forgot to mention as one of the, the routes that Satan was taking um Again, Nephilim means uh, comes from the word gigantes. They were they were gigantes in those days, which means giants, and they were. But it would also mean that they were earthborn. And I think this is some sort of scheme or attack that Satan has always been trying to do throughout life, whether it's creating the giants, the men of renown, you know, the the mighty men of old, or creating these hybrid forms of like half human half animal breeds and destroying the purity of what man was supposed to be from the creation of god um all the way to this new ai system and i i forgot i did forget to throw in the nazis too because he i think one of the routes that saint was taken was well if i can't corrupt the human race through this extra stuff being added into it i'm going to corrupt it through their own selfishness and pridefulness of thinking that purity was a way and this is where we get eugenics and everything that was taught in nazi germany and even here in the u.s and many places around the world in the 30s where you were the supreme race or there was a, a supreme being from evolution where we evolved into something greater and grander and everyone else was just these uh animals which needed to be put down and that's where they honed in on you know the the jewish race and black people and people with mental deficiencies and so they were trying to exterminate everyone so <clears throat> there's many different routes that satan takes to bring this into play and i think ai is going to be one of those routes again i think ai is amoral which means that there's it's neither good nor, nor bad it's it's how you use it just as how you would use money or how you would use weapons whether it's for defense or offense or you're, you're using it to attack people to rob to take money from them as opposed to protecting your family there's many things which are amoral and i believe that technology and this ai is one of them <clears throat> I'm not like the Amish. We're thinking, you know, all technology is bad and we need to go back to horse and plow. It's like, buddy, horse and plow is still technology from that period. So it's like, where's where's your where's your great schism to divide your technology from the technology of today? You know, you're making things easier. Well, a horse and plow is still easier and it's still, you know, a, 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 you know, a construction of man's hands to make things easier. So uh, in light of that, I think certain things that we make to make our lives easier to bring in better prosperity is amoral, but it's how you use it and what is the intent that we are going to be using it for. So we need to keep our eyes on this. We need to be aware of what is happening and hopefully God will flip the tables of what is going on. I hear a leaf blower going on out there. Oh, I almost forgot to mention, uh, the mother-in-law stopped by today and dropped off some of the um, clothes of my father-in-law that he didn't need. This is why I'm wearing the shirt. I wanted to show off my turkey shirt. I feel like a 1970s couch. So um, maybe I'll wear that for Thanksgiving. But I believe those are the only things that I really wanted to bring up in today's episode of Tidbits. It looks like we're meeting the 15-minute uh, mark really quick here. So I'm going to cut that out. Um, and I will see you next week when we go into the reason for communion. Until then, take care, God bless, and stay strong in the Lord.